Okay, so I've just hit the record button and it was midway through Fred describing this conversation as something of a jazz band where we all pass the baton around and don't try to be coherent. So, um, or, or was that, or was that, so that was something like that anyway. So uh, my name's Jonathan Worth and it's great to, to be able to pull together, well, to be able to speak with um, Fred Richin and, uh, and Lars Kuzner. Uh, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, so that uh, they do a much better job than I can. Lars, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, um, I'm an artist uh, based in Oslo. Um, I, uh, I'm a Swedish artist based in Oslo. I grew up in Canada. That's uh, confusing, maybe, but that's sort of the biography side of it. And I work with a very um, uh, politically based work, I guess, but it's, uh, it's really based around... Um, the idea of creating expectations and uh, exploring what expectations can create as far as, as the work that you're uh, interacting with. That's what I've been trying to work with. Fred. Yeah, I'm Fred Richardson. I'm based in New York. I'm the dean of the school at the International Center of Photography. I use, I think of education as a, as a laboratory where you could try out ideas. It's much more fluid, open than working for most publications or galleries or whatever. It's, it, it's all the time just a place for ideas. I've written several books on the future of imaging. Uh, the last one, Bending the Frame, the previous one after photography. And I've been picture editor of the New York Times Sunday Magazine and things like that. And my interest is, has often been in can photography be useful in in changing society for the better uh th that's certainly a piece of it it's it's i'm also interested in the digital as expanding possibilities for expression in personal ways artistic ways and so on but but that's that's kind of the quick summary great and my name is jonathan worth and originally i was a photographer who um whose business model changed fundamentally and uh, i've become more interested in photography as a means rather than an ends and so the classes that I teach really um, at the minute, the minute they look to, uh, to help empower people to participate in their own representation, which is the tagline that I'm sticking with right now. And it means that I get to pull together people who have otherwise perhaps might not meet, but have something really interesting to say. Um, so I met, met you Lars earlier in the year, or late last year uh, at a conference, and you talked about your work and what I was really excited about because I was thinking about something that Fred had, had talked recently about which is this notion of the useful photographer. And he talked about the, I still had this idea of the peaceful photographer that he'd also plant in my head. Sorry, the, the peace photographer versus the war photographer. And the word that you talked, uh, talked about, about this idea of creating expectations, seemed to be using um, anxiety as an agent for change. You know, it, it spoke to this idea of a uh, loss aversion that economists talk about, that, where people uh, fear, well, where people sort of weigh losses or pers prospective losses about twice as much as they do gains or prospective gains. And, and suddenly there seemed to be something that was uh, really interesting there that we might perhaps riff on, as, as Fred says, in our, in, our, in our little jazz band here, and um, or uses a springboard. But could you talk a little bit, Lars, about, um, about the two projects that you mentioned? Um, yeah, maybe I'll start, um, I'll go move backwards, because this the idea was to work with this notion of metanoia, and Fred brought this up too, I mean, this idea, this is a biblical term, I guess, of changing so fundamentally your whole belief system or what you believe in that uh, in such a strong way that, uh, you know, it, it, it changes uh, even what you think is going to happen to you after you die. But this kind of change, this kind of uh, this this profound change, only happens to you once or twice in your life, and uh, it's interesting to see how this kind of change can be produced. And talking about the the function of um, of art in public that was supposed to uh, somehow evoke emotions about past uh, traumas or wars or these public sculptures or public memorials that were somehow supposed to unite, unify communities through uh, a collective experience of something that they usually haven't experienced uh, was something that I wanted to approach from a position of weakness, that it was weak. So I was using this, um, 
This example in England, Bradley Stokes, this small town that was newly established that, uh, that wanted to build a war memorial but weren't allowed to because nobody in that town had ever died in a war. Uh, so they suggested instead building a future war memorial that would have a, uh, uh, plaques for names, but it was blank, so that they would add the names of people as they die in the wars and the futures. And this thing became ridiculed and laughed at, and they decided not to do it. But, um, anyways, it was my, it was my suggestion that, that, uh, I mean, because anxieties have been exploited so much already, uh, it's time that we get to know anxiety. And Fred will know this, being American, I think, that there's gone through these waves of, what was it, in the 50s was the age of anxiety in the States. And now there's a new age of anxiety that is somehow supposed to unify, and it turns us more nationalistic. It allows us to... Um, easier affiliate with ideologies and uh, theology. So the, the way that anxiety, uh, the need for us to unify, anxiety makes it easy for, uh, for us to grab on to something just so we have a common understanding. Uh, but this is based out of fear then, that we don't really know where we're, we're heading or the fear or the dangers that are facing us. So then the suggestion was to build memorials for futures, future tragedies that are actually being predicted. Like found out what tragedies and disasters are actually being prepared for and build monuments based on those predictions. Uh, maybe that was a bit jazz all in its... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> That's that's great. I mean, you also you also spoke about um, another body of work, which was where you were creating a human zoo, which was to tap into something that had happened, but then to to get funding to set another one up, which speaks to this uh, this this notion of deception, which I know is on Fred's mind at the minute. Yeah. Do you want me to talk a bit about that? Very very briefly, if you could just yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were trying to. Uh, bring up this notion of human zoos and anybody can google this. I certainly didn't learn about it in school but uh, it's a uh, there there's information about it online but we were trying to bring up the bring up the story in Norway that there had been a human zoo in Norway and we called it a reenactment that we were getting ready for a reenactment but our position was that you know whenever you reenact history or you re whenever you try to represent uh, something that has happened, the disappointment is is guaranteed in the experience itself because it'll never be able to be history. So the way that we wanted to do that, uh, to represent this misrepresentation, was to create it in the imagination of the collective. So we basically based the whole project around making people believe that there was going to be a reenactment and built up the village as it was a hundred years ago. And um, uh, anyways, the point was that, that in order to, to, to recreate history, to elicit an emotional response, uh, the, the imagination of that event is much stronger than actually engaging in a recreation or a reenactment of that history, which will always be fake, and it's a futile uh, exercise because the disappointment will be, uh, is, is guaranteed somehow. So we created the expectation that we were going to do this and gave an even larger anti-climax, if you will. There was no people in the, in the zoo when people came to the opening. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there in Sweden, Fred, and I'm hearing this, and I, what, I'm thinking about your idea of, of, um, of the useful photographer. Um, and so you, I hope you can understand why it was, I thought I'd, I'd j jump at the first opportunity to get you guys together. But I, I think at the minute you're thinking perhaps less about the book that you wrote, uh, what, five, six, seven, eight years ago and, uh, and current events. I wonder if you could bring us up to date right now and tell us what you're thinking about now, about the, something about perhaps the point of the professional community or um, what, should a, what, what does a professional photographer look like and do now? No, but, but to, to riff off a, a bit Lars in the jazz vein here, I think we do a lot of de to defend ourselves against the painful things in the world that are going on. One thing is to 
not know if a photograph itself is actually reporting on something or fabricated. So if you don't know the difference and it's painful, you just assume it's fabricated. So you don't have to deal with it. It's somebody's imagination. It's not real. Or you recreate, photo, you know, going back to what Lars is saying, you re recreate photographs of the past so they look like older events that have already happened have been resolved. So you don't have to deal with them today. So if it looks like Vietnam, oh, it's okay, it's already over. You know, it's a kind of an unconscious thing of saying, gee, that, it's finished, so okay. Or you just ignore it altogether, which is what also happens very much in publications where you just don't show any of it for one reason or another because it doesn't sell advertising, readers don't like it, print publications are going out of business, you don't want to offend the readers, the corporate problems, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of reasons to conspire against feeling the world and what's going on in the world, both the positive, the negative, and, and the complexity of it, really. So the worst possible thing is to think you know it, when in fact what you're looking at is either a simulation, a simulacrum, a camouflage, or whatever it would be, it's actually undercutting it, because it's, it's, you know, when you don't eat dinner, you know you didn't, didn't eat dinner, but if you eat a whole bunch of vitamin pills and you say, oh, that was your dinner, well, that wasn't your dinner. But, but in, in some sense, what you're seeing in photographs is this sort of synthetic replacement for the, for the real with something that's, that you don't really know what it is anymore. And I think we've all conspired to make that happen. I think it's better for us because there's less pain. We don't have to deal with the world and we don't have to feel guilty. You know, the Doctors Without Borders a long time ago, Kushner said, Bernard Kushner, without a photograph, there's never a massacre because nobody believes the eyewitness, right? So the eyewitness is too biased. But now if there's no photograph, because we don't really know if it's a photograph or if it's a fabrication, there's no massacre either. So there's no way then of knowing what's happening elsewhere in the world outside your own community you don't really don't want to know or it's photographed or done so it looks like a Hollywood film whatever so that's another way to reject it for example you know like that so the idea of the useful photographer is somebody who says I'm aware of all that stuff that stuff doesn't work I don't want to be part of that stuff but I want to do something that's actually useful one of the usefulness is is to be a peace photographer so you're proactive instead of reactive instead of waiting for the apocalypse and making great images you try to do something so the apocalypse does not happen. So if it's climate change, for example, instead of waiting for the amazing floods and horrible things that make such great pictures, you try to make images to show people where to build a dam or whatever it would be in a proactive way. The same with conflict, war, and so on. You try to do something to diffuse it before waiting to win the award as the best war photographer. You try to do something before there's a war, before there's the apocalypse in all that. So the useful photographer, you know, it's, it's the idea, Kappa had the idea, if your photographs aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. Well, you know, Todd Papajorb had the idea, if your pictures aren't good, if photographs aren't good enough, you don't read enough books. So to me, the useful photographer has to be the thoughtful photographer who says anybody could go out and just, you know, photograph the riot down the street, you know, and make good pictures. And certainly you have to need courage and, and there's lots of reasons to applaud people who do it. But simultaneously, you also want somebody who could say, I know there's going to be a riot. What can I do to prevent it? Are there any images that I could make before it happens? How do you do that? Instead of just falling into the, the kind of genre of photography, which looks like other photographs, so therefore must be good. You know, all the reasons that diffuse and, and, and don't deal with what's going on out there. So it's really reinventing the practice is what I'm arguing for in a big way. And so education for me isn't just doing what the other people did before you. Sometimes it's useful, but it's often just saying, this is the systems at work and I have to reinvent my practice to attack it from a different way, which is much more productive. And, and do you, and, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sitting here wondering if in fact, um, wondering if in fact you're talking about photography anymore. I mean, if indeed, I mean, I didn't really hear photography as being central to any of that. I mean, you know, this idea of photography losing its evidential currency, I mean, you know, you've, you've talked about quotations from the world and, um, you know, the, the, the photographers, the images as opposed to photographs aren't, aren't necessarily that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing in Lars' work there the way that he motivates people and, and galvanizes people uh, into, into acting before something happens with the threat of what might happen as being, as being the useful not photographer, but the useful 
what activist? I mean, how do you feel about that, Lars? Did you, did you think that was uh, that was somebody talking about photography, or did you well, hear? no. I mean, I think there's uh, there's lots of uh, there's a lot of different forms of humanitarian violence, and and photography certainly has a, a um, has a, a huge responsibility in that. And and uh, when it comes to to um, portraying reality and passing that uh, your image of reality onto other people, uh, you sort of take on that responsibility. And it seems to me that um, that that photographers have a, a, a heavier burden to carry there because the expectation of of producing uh, some some form of representation of reality. Uh, is implicit even when it's a constructed uh, situation it's it's assumed as a construction of reality and it's a it's both a luxury and a burden I think in photography but uh, I do think that this kind of uh, this idea of preemptive uh, engagement or preemptive uh, activity um, is something that's already being done and exploited negatively. It's it's already an oppressive tool, because uh, you know preparing for the worst, or preparing for the best, preparing for uh, a better, preparing for something uh, better, a utopian idea. All these uh, these 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 preparatory ideas have some kind of threat. Uh, baked into them I guess you you could say that that the it is the threat that motivates uh, action not the fact that you believe that it's actually going to get better but the threat is that it's not going to get better unless you uh, are involved in there so there's like this threat of you're going to die because this shit's going to happen or you're going to die if you don't do anything about it so I don't know um, I don't know how you change this. I don't know how you could change this in the way that you're talking about, Fred, of, of sort of uh, dealing with photography in that sense, because the way you're talking about it, it seems that um, uh, photographers are kind of in a shitty situation where if they don't uh, document the horrific realities of the world they're not doing their job somehow so they need those horrific activities to happen no i think that the field itself for a long time you know it's like the shock of the photos has has looked at photography to be shocking you know i think that's over mm -hmm. i don't think that people are looking for the shock i think in fact it's the opposite i think people know there's so much shock out there that they don't look at all you know so i don't i don't think that's that's where it's at i think in one reason you know isis's success in showing shock beheadings and so on is you know they've carved out a t well it's a bad verb but there's a territory that they've created for themselves which is the most shocking and the most you know they they they've gone beyond where we've been before so i think there's a movement among photographers to to be less sensational, less uh, explosive with the imagery, uh, you know, to be quieter, but to actually be a little more helpful, you know, in one way or another. If you want to build a school down the street, you know, and you show, you know, that there's a vacant lot in the pictures and you show the other schools overcrowded and you need it and so on, that's not the issue there of horror. That's, that's the issue of being constructive in a very local you know, practical way. You know, if your house is leaking, you, you know, you try to plug the leak. That that's not apocalyptic. That's just doing stuff. And I think there's a big movement now with NGOs and so on, for photographers to try to be helpful in some of those, you know, very pragmatic ways. I don't think that those kinds of images, though, necessarily are the ones that are celebrated or thought much about. And so, what I'm arguing for is there a practice which is, you know, and targeted in a sense. There, there's a specific problem, what can be done to help it? I'm not talking necessarily always about these grand anxieties, you know, that are planetary or, or so on. There, there are many, many, you know, very local and, and specific issues that, that can be dealt with as well. 
But what I am saying is that the vocabulary that's being used by, of imagery has to be expanded enormously so that we could say things in different ways. And, you know, I agree with what you just said, that a constructed image can be very useful in doing it. Um, all media can be useful in doing it. And I don't think any more is the so-called photograph within quotes is somehow the most privileged of, of witnessing media anymore. I don't think it works anymore that way. And so I think that if somebody, you know, does 800 selfies, you know, to build a school, you know, by 800 school children, you know, we all know that selfies themselves are manipulations and so on. But if that gets the school built, that's fine. But that's not the older photographic methodology anymore. So I think we do have to expand and Jonathan, to answer your question, I, I, I think the jury's out right now on what, what a photograph actually is at this point. I'm just distinguishing between the older idea of the photograph as having specific reference points, quotation from appearances. And I think that the image world that we're moving into, uh, that's certainly a minority of what that image world is about at this point. It, it's kind of a 20th century idea, which is still useful at times, but it certainly is not emblematic of what most of what camera produced imagery is at this point. It's it's a minority of that. No, uh, I uh, yeah, it is the thing that excites me most. I mean, I I, I think now of, of images versus photographs for images as being data visualizations, and uh, you know the top layer of something that once peeled off reveals reveals the real story. And I'm I'm really excited about all the all the p uh, potential sort of. Um, things to investigate with regard to that but that's uh, perhaps a different um, but I wondered if you could go back a bit Fred um, and talk about um, I, I talk about ISIS actually and uh, their use of the media I, I, uh, I've been teaching a class just recently and um, and I asked them out of curiosity I asked them how many people I asked them first of all if, if who knew of what ISIS was and IS uh, what IS is and of course all, all hands went up it was a class of 52 mainly international students um, all hands went up and everybody uh, had, a, had a pretty pretty good idea of um, of, of where of, of what IS is and what was happening in the world. And so I asked them what what um, what then was the first thing that pops into their head. And they uh, obviously first thing they were saying was um, abuse and sort of uh, beheadings and so on. And they talked about the uh, documenting of the beheadings that um, they were all aware of. And so I asked how many of them had actually seen these. And out of a room of 52 people, only one hand went up. And that was still questionable about whether that one person had actually seen anything at all. She said, I've, there was some stuff that was passed around a Facebook page. Now, I thought that was really interesting because um, no one's actually seen any of this stuff. We've seen stills that have been repeated. I'm, I'm sure perhaps you, you have. Um, but, you know, I ask around the general populace, the people that uh, I live with, next door neighbours and people that I see in the pub and so on. And no one's actually seen any of, the, any of these images. But everybody talks about them. They've, they've had a real impact. And I wondered if... Um, if we should perhaps think about that in terms of, well, uh, you mentioned earlier, Fred, the uh, the winning world press image and the fact that IS images haven't been considered there because they are, inverted commas, um, amateur. No, but I think it gets the issue of what is the professional photographer doing at this point. Uh, I think it was Jean-Jacques Naudet, I believe, today in the eye of the photograph, the, the blog that he does, the online publication, you know, was saying that... Um, you know, we were, live in a world of imagery, imagery that's eaten the professional photojournalists. At first, that was like the first course, they got eaten. And now it's eating the advertising people and the fashion people, they're getting eaten. And except for a few hardy souls who still go to war, that's really all that's left of the profession at this point. And that everything's turned into image, it's the language of image now. And it, it's, it's almost like, you know, we culturally we've sort of thanked the pioneers, and but we we we've devoured them and turned it into something else now. And I think to a certain extent he's right, because I think certainly photographers are are you know have vision and have ideas and and can be incredibly useful. But I, I don't think there's a society that we're that interested in it that more. It's a I always think, you know, of oil painting, you know, which, which was representational in the 19th century. And then you had, you know, Van Gogh or Picasso or whatever. Who's that interested anymore in representational oil painting when you can go and see a cubist image? 
you know, it's much more interesting. It's much more exciting. It changes things. It pushes things. And I think there's a certain, in one sense, a kind of, a, a, we, we've gone beyond the photograph, which is also the reason why we're going to rediscover photography, you know, because it does certain things very, very differently. It's not at all the same as image making in a contemporary vein. It does something, you know, that's worthy of discovery. That's quite amazing. And it seems even more unique and thoughtful now than it did at the time, because compared to what's going on today, it is quite different. So I think we're in that period of sort of, you know, eating our past, moving into a future which is, you know, much more sort of, you know, melded. It's 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 smoothed out. It doesn't have those sort of sharp edges of the photograph. And simultaneously, we will be more and more rediscovering the sharp edges of the older photographs that actually have something to say based on unique individual vision, camera vision, perspective, and so on and so forth, and light, and all those things that, that are very, very different than, than what you see in Instagram or what you see today. It's, uh, it's, it's a kind of homogenization at this point. And I, I agree with you that underneath the image, you know, where you have the data, you know, where you have you know, the, the, the algorithms, where, where all the systems live, you know, the digital systems live under the image, that it can then explode forth, that the image becomes music at that point, you know, that the image itself, you know, being code-based is connected to human genetic code, that we find all these other kind of reference points and ideas in it that are so different than the older photography but we're just waiting for that almost to sprout at this point. But if you just peel back the image underneath it, those systems are incredibly powerful in terms of potential of what they have to tell us about ourselves, about our, our planet, about our cosmos, about our philosophies, about our religions, about our past. And that's the stuff that we're just getting ready to start to explore. Yes, you've talked in the past about stop. You t I think you told me you said stop talking about post photography, Jonathan. And start thinking about pre enlightenment. Um, I tried that and I didn't get very far, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, to have pre enlightenment, you, there has to be a desire for enlightenment, and I think that we've reached the point of the billions and billions and billions and billions of images where we can't see anymore, and so I think it is the moment where we where we are searching the enlightenment, which is not based upon those billions of images. In fact, those billions of images, rather than illuminating, are occluding enough, are closing down enough, that it's for forcing us back into ourselves in different ways, and we're going to come out of it with thoughts that transcend far beyond the billions of images that we make every day. Well, the, Lars, I wonder if uh, you had any thoughts on that. I mean, you, one of the things that, um, that strikes me from that um, that uh, overwhelming sort of I notion of, uh, of overwhelming images and not knowing quite what to do with them all is um, you have been very successful at stirring people and uh, moving them to action and galvanizing them. I mean, I wonder what photographers can learn from you. What, 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 what do you think about this as you, as you hear, Fred? Well, I think we're not that far, uh, far away from each other in thinking. I think that um, th those images, those images that maybe we are moving towards do incorporate um, other kind of experiential and subjective ex uh, ways of, of, of uh, interacting with things, maybe other senses even. Because you talk about ISIS and people saying that they've seen images that they haven't seen because those images don't exist, is because the, the narrative fits the, the idea of the emotion that it elicits. The, it elicits a, an emotion that you sort of recognize and it hits close to home. It's almost like the, um, well, Swedish example then, uh, the Estonian ferry that sunk. It was a ferry that went from Sweden to Estonia. Uh, most Swedes, you know, this was like one of the most traumatic events in, in a lot of Swedes' lives, collective tra tragedies. Most Swedes said that they saw this on video, but there was never any video footage of this. But most Swedes will say that they absolutely saw this on video. But I think the, the closer you get to something emotionally, the, the better you are at creating an imaginary image of what it is you think it is. 
And um, this imaginary image, if you can capture this imaginary image, as, which is what we were trying to work with, what is, uh, we were trying to uh, extract the, the representation that existed in the imagination of the collective of something that had been forgotten, a historical event. We don't really think that we can re recreate the historical event, but we do want to find out what kind of representation exists in that imagination collectively. And um, uh, I mean, I would love to be able to uh, th to think of the possibility of uh, amateurs and professionals alike being able to capture an image of the imagination of whatever comes up. Doesn't matter how ridiculous that imagination is, doesn't matter how stereotypical that imagination is, doesn't matter how influenced by by uh, advertising or propaganda or whatever it is, if you're able to actually create an image of your uh, your imagination of something, fear or whatever, then I think you can start talking about uh, engaging in something that could actually produce real change because you have to sort of <laughs> see a representation of the way you think. Hmm. It's, um, it's, it's fascinating, Lars, it's, it really is. Um, we are sort of running uh, out of time. You both said you'd, you'd be able to give me 20 minutes and I've uh, craftily stolen at least 30, so I'm, uh, I'm really grateful for you, grateful for you, for you both. Um, I wonder if you could uh, give us something to think about. So there are a bunch of photographers, a lot of students who will listen, who will listen to this. Um, uh, something to think about, maybe a piece of work or a practicing photographer or artist, Lars, uh, that you think at the minute is, uh, is interesting you, or perhaps, perhaps it's a writer. Just something that you think is interesting that we can go on and uh, begin to sort of uh, investigate. Fred, what's, what's perked your, uh, piqued your interest recently? No, just on the basis of, you know, many, many things, but on the basis of this conversation, you know, I just go back to the Brian Eno idea from t almost 25 years ago. You know, why make a, a piece of music? You know, why, why compose, why create one? To him, it was like a potted plant. He, he, he was thinking it'd be much better to have the seed you know, an algorithm, so that after he dies, the algorithm would make music, you could kind of mate it with an algorithm of John Coltrane and the jazz refrain or Beethoven or whatever you want. They can mutate, they can make new music, other stuff could happen. So that the algorithm itself would express his musical ideas in it and would push in different places. And you know, in a way, those ideas that, you know, you, you can, you know, photograph uh, out your window or a battle and you could output it as music or you could output it, you know, as a completely as a painting or as a piece of text or whatever you want, that there's this transmedia possibilities now that just because you're holding a camera doesn't mean you're a photographer. You could be a musician. You could be somebody else at this point. And so my loyalty is not to the tradition of the medium. My loyalty is to how do we explore who we are, where we are at this moment in the universe. And we use whatever we can do to get at it. So, you know, I'm teaching now largely through short stories. I'm teaching a course called Images and Ideas through short stories. Because in the short stories, the fiction, the ideas are extraordinary that people come up with. Um, and why not? I mean, you know, what, do what we do. If you're a three-year-old or a five-year-old, you know, and they give you paint, you know, you may throw it against the wall. Why not? I mean, Jackson Pollock had a good career doing that. You know, do whatever makes sense and push it in different ways, but don't be slavishly following this idea of tra tradition, especially when, in the case of photography, for example, the tradition is so much in question at this point. Lars, what, what, do you, what, what words of wisdom are you going to leave us with? Well, I mean, uh, at, at, at least my, my distance to photography is that, you know, those times when I come into it, it seems like it's always in, in, uh, in this state of, of, uh, of 
dissolving. It, I don't know. It's the, the the question of of the, the the worthiness of photography. I don't know. That's a tough one for me to get into. But I do like some things that um, uh, some things that are producing a, a, a problem in ways of viewing imagery, though. And that's actually imagination too. But I like this piece um, by David Spriggs. He puts layers of of images on polyurethane plastic. And create, recently created this massive. Um, uh, it looks like a monument of a soldier on a horse. Basic classic, uh, uh, you know, uh, authoritarian sculpture that's supposed to look down on you or something. But these are images in layers, and it becomes uh, almost uh, holographic when you look at it because it's just layers of images next to each other. So then the. <laughs> when we get into like holographs of 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 images um, of of images that we're used to seeing as as very authoritarian uh, we might actually get a new relationship to to uh, to those things and ideas so the only words of wisdom I was gonna say was um, is to maybe uh, look for development in in uh, in holo holograms and holographs because I think they can provide a, another uh, perspective on uh, on the three dimensional world that we are very sort of closed into when we look at it in two dimensions. Alrighty, and I want to direct people to look at your work around. The Bradley Stokes War Memorial for, to photographers who uh, to photographers to uh, to soldiers who hadn't died, which I think is completely fantastic and definitely worth investigating. Um, thanks very much, chaps. Hope we get chance to meet again and talk again. Um, but um, for now, we shall say goodbye. Thanks, goodbye. Fred. Take care. Good to meet you. Take care. Take care.